Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Our webinar will begin in one moment. Well, good morning from sunny Edmonton. My name is Chelsea Reschke, and I'm the Director of Business Development for our oil and gas team here in the capital city. Along with my co-sponsor, Angie Bates, who leads up the Environmental Services team, we decided we wanted to deliver the breakfast series experience via webinar so we could keep the conversations rolling while still enjoying a moment's pause to connect and reinvigorate. So for this third presentation in our innovation series, we are all going to enjoy breakfast from the comfort of our homes. Now, just a couple of housekeeping items before I introduce our speakers, Joe Riddell and Chris Jorstad. Everyone will be muted for the presentation. Each presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A, which you can put forth your questions via the questions box to get your topic in the queue. The nice thing about a virtual delivery is that all the questions that are not addressed during the live session will receive our follow-up after the event ends. The presentations are also being recorded and will be shared after the event. So if your colleagues were unable to attend or you feel it would be a valuable piece of information to share with them, you're able to do so. And as always, the post-event surveys are our guide to delivering the most relevant and sought after co content to you. We appreciate all the excellent feedback we've received on the event so far, and we'll be using them again to deliver the next round. So for our safety moment, I uh, wanted to share Stantec's energy wheel. The energy wheel came about following some research that up to 40% of hazards are not correctly identified. So how can we ensure there are fewer gaps in the hazard identification practice? Well, this tool is meant to help employees assess risks on the basis of the 10 sources of energy. Every incident is the result of unwanted release of one or more of those energy sources. So by starting at the top and working around the circle in a clockwise fashion, we are able to pause and evaluate which of the energy sources pose a risk and effectively close the gaps in identification. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Joseph Riddell to introduce himself and launch our first presentation. Over to you, Joe. Thanks very much, Chelsea. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Joe, hydrogeologist working in the Edmonton uh, office as well. Uh, outside of work, uh, my interests are things like I find them to be self-sustaining interests, I like to call them, pr uh, primarily uh, brewing beer, uh, mountain biking, gardening, running, hunting, fishing. I've got a pellet pellet grill too that I quite enjoy smoking some of my uh, harvested meats from both land and sea um, and uh, like many people in this COVID weirdness I've learned to bake over this uh, last little while and make pretty good buns and bread and whatnot at this point. So with that uh, let's get started with my presentation. I'm just going to advance the slide here. Okay so I've uh, welcome to my talk and thanks for attending. It's uh, I've entitled it 3D conceptual site models. I might refer to them as 3D CSMs for short, but uh, it's a value assessment framework. So what I hope to do with this presentation is equip uh, you, the client, potential client that may be seeking to develop a conceptual site model, uh, a framework for you to assess the value, whether it's right for your projects or not. Okay. So very quick agenda um, with the limited time that we have to discuss some of these things. Um, I'm going to quickly introduce, uh, frame the utility of the value of 3D conceptual site models, answer some fundamental questions about what they are. Uh, the bulk of the presentation will be spent on some practical examples. Uh, most of the practical examples I've used are uh, energy industry specific, um, but that is not to say that I have not used these across multiple sectors, 3D CSMs that is, um, for things such as urban design and planning, stormwater management facilities, water resourcing evaluations, major infrastructure projects, and in some cases, forensic hydrogeology, or looking at when groundwater interferes with a given project, uh, what are the processes uh, causing that interference and, and how to mitigate them in some cases. So with those after those practical examples, I 
want to quickly uh, provide a summary and, and some opportunity for you to ask questions. Okay. So let's get right into describing uh, what 3D conceptual site models are. So in this presentation, I really hope to answer three fundamental questions. What, what they are, what is a 3D conceptual site model, and also why and when to use them. And now this is, a, this is evolving uh, with uh, the industry as digital data acquisition, the ability to manipulate and format data in near real time, and not to mention huge amounts of data, is most certainly pushing the 3D models into to more mainstream consulting, excuse me. And uh, it, uh, Angie and, and Chelsea have done a great job putting these two presentations together in that the next presenter, Chris, uh, will have a nice follow-up presentation as the CD, 3D CSMs that I'm presenting are highly visual, but they're at their core, they're data-driven. So with Chris's presentation, you'll see how the digital data acquisition and the ability to format and manipulate data in an efficient way will really improve the workflows and contribute to more and more of these 3D models being developed. Okay, so the most fundamental question that we should uh, answer before we go on with some of these project examples are, is what what is a 3D CSM or conceptual site model? Well, fundamentally, it's an assemblage of all available data, geospatial data in particular. So this could be for any given site, whether it's a gas station or a, uh, a small, um, remedial dig to a terminal or a landfill or even an, an entire region like a watershed. 3D conceptual site models, the workflow and the, um, the development of these models is scale independent, meaning it can be used for small scales uh, with very complex small problems or it can be used at large scales with similarly complex problems as well. So qu quite simply, these are shoehorning all the available information into uh, a fully three-dimensional environment. So that would be things like borehole information and, and core data, um, semi-quantitative data that's often very difficult to integrate into analysis, such as location of groundwater discharge or springs. Gravel pits can be um, sort of uh, semi-quantitative as well in that you know there's permeable deposits if you can map sand and gravel deposits. Um, downhole and or survey geophysics can be integrated into the digital model or 3D CSM, as well as remote sense data, such as LIDAR or topography data. And in a lot of cases, you add value to what people sometimes think of antiquated maps, paper products, flat sheet type mapping. They can be integrated into the digital environment too, to great effect. So with what a CSM uh, being out of the way, what it is, um, let's answer some of the other fundamental questions, like when and why to make a 3D CSM. Um, I'll be the first to admit that these things are not required for all jobs, small phase two environmental site assessments, small remedial digs, uh, sites without in enough data might qualify as, as uh, instances where you would not even consider a 3D CSM. However, if it's within the realm of possibility that you're considering developing a conceptual site model for a given project or site, excuse me, there are several thresholds one has to consider. Uh, to evaluate the value and, and whether development of a CSM is going to bring you value. So scale is one of them. So how much data is there? Is it too much data for typical workflows like maps and cross sections or is there not enough? If there's not enough you're not going to go ahead. Um, in terms of complexity there's thresholds associated with that. Is it just a, a, a single unit like like till like you'd find over a you know, large portions of Alberta, or very simple two-layer cake geology, or contrastingly, is it fractured flow or preferential pathways? Are there multiple contaminants of concern? These are the sort of thresholds that you might consider in terms of deciding whether a 3D CSM is useful to you. Budget is obviously fairly self-explanatory, although in my experience, it's been shown that um, development of a 3D CSM can actually mitigate a lot of risk, um, some of which can be mitigated or or, or handled uh, in a construction scenario or so forth. But sometimes when those problems are unforeseen or a greater magnitude than expected, there's often some forensic hydrogeology or a 3D CSM that's made after the fact to try to ascertain what went, what went wrong and how to fix it. So the budget, it can be a little bit non-intuitive that there's an upfront cost, but it might save you money in the end. 
And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, um, I hope to show that these are highly visual uh, and collapse very complicated geospatial problems down to something that everybody can understand, whether you're a layperson or whether you are um, an expert in the field. Okay, so depending on your project and depending on, um, excuse me, depending on uh, what the objectives of the projects are, these thresholds might have different weighting. I think I have a small animation here. Um, it didn't show up, but basically the animation was supposed to uh, indicate that these 3D CSMs in terms of when to make them, they're very useful at any part of a project lifestyle, life cycle, sorry, uh, but they have particular value when they're adopted early um, for, for new sites and new construction going forward because you have that fundamental uh, data management piece, you understand your site really well, and you can sometimes avoid problems before you get into them. Okay, with the introductory stuff out of the way, um, now it's time to look at some of the, the practical examples. So I've got four practical examples, and it's important to note that these are all static uh, output from the 3D CSM. So it's not as valuable as an, a live demonstration uh, with somebody like myself driving the model, such that you can see your data in person, be able to cut, take sections, ask questions, and it's very interactive. Um, so with that in mind, these are prepackaged snapshots of these models, but I think you'll still find that within five minutes per example, you'll be able to get a very good idea of site conditions through very simple to understand schematic, high visual impact uh, uh, figures and drawings. With that in mind, let's go through the examples. So this is an example of uh, early in the life cycle, a CSM was adopted. So this is in terminal pre-planning and construction. So this is a site in the capital region, kind of an infill, infill sorry, terminal with uh, uh, groundwater interference anticipated in that they actually dug into the side of a hill nine meters in order to make a flat tank pad. And you'll see why that's a problem and why there is groundwater uh, interference in a minute. Um, the site is typified by highly irregular bedrock topography, heterogeneous geology with permeable um, coal seams and sand seams throughout the footprint of this site. Okay, so let's dig into the site. Looking at it from above, now let's look at it in three dimensions. So here's where the highly uh, visual, impactful um, uh, utility of the 3D conceptual site model comes in. So much like the what is a 3D CSM slide, this is similar. So if you think back to that slide where I went clockwise around with the data, Firstly, we have our topography and all our borehole data hung from the topography to make a block model. Um, within that block model, we've hung uh, both historical monitoring wells that were on the previous owner uh, or on the site, but when the previous owner owned it, we've hung the recent geotechnical information that was completed just prior to commencing construction of the terminal. And eventually, as the model is a dynamic tool, once the terminal was constructed and a monitoring network needed to be established, the data from those monitoring network boreholes and monitoring wells were also integrated into the 3D CSM. Uh, the middle frame is just showing uh, the topography uh, captured through remote sense data, LIDAR image, and you can see that there's a large retaining wall at the back that's almost nine meters high, and it kind of uh, goes to a few meters high in the foreground there. Um, lastly, on the right, this is showing how we can not only implement the geological volumes, so the, the dark being a fill material, the green being a till, the dark gray being a bedrock. Um, we can also, in addition to those geological volumes based on borehole data, implement anthropogenic or man-made st structures such as the soil mixing columns underneath some of these tanks to shore up the geotechnical or the geomechanical properties in order for the tanks not to sink. Um, and so you can see in one quick oblique view of a 3D conceptual site model, you can see that we have ascertained the highly irregular bedrock geology, all these oranges within these boreholes, I know they're difficult to see, but our sand seams that are, we're causing problems. And uh, we will get into that in the next slide. So this, as I mentioned, introducing this example, there was groundwater interference issues. So as they advanced the uh, grading, the site grading and develop the retaining wall, those sand seams and to some extent uh, coal seams within the bedrock unit that were permeable, fractured and permeable, were dumping a lot more water or groundwater ingression was coming through the retaining wall 
and making very difficult conditions, obviously in this red area where it was hot, very wet and they were having water management issues. So this 3DCSM was really facilitated by the fact they were having these, these issues and they didn't know what to do to uh, mitigate it uh, such that they could can carry on, meet their construction deadlines, et cetera. So what we did was we used this 3D CSM as an opportunity to uh, develop it site-wide, but with a focus on the, this uh, wet corner in order to design a dewatering system that intercepted some of those sand seams, coal seams, et cetera, that were causing acute problems for the construction. Um, and this is just another quick slide to show that once we had sort of got the dewatering and the water ingression issues under control prior to their um, installation of this blue weeping tile, which in the end during standard operation would uh, suffice to dewater that corner, um, we've also in implemented some of the um, piping between tanks as well as the fire, uh, fire suppression system piping. So not only is it good for the geology, but at some point you can start looking at the facility infrastructure, the drilling constraints that uh, imposes on some of the monitoring networks, et cetera. So with that early life cycle uh, example out of the way, um, we were gonna move to a new one, which is kind of mid life cycle or compliance monitoring, monitoring and management. So this is intentionally um, somewhat of a boring slide, um, but it's packed with information. Um, this is uh, a snapshot of my, my live model view in the software called LeapFrog that I use to do these models. And within this is a great deal of information and it's all at your fingertips. Within this, uh, long-term monitoring data, it's a long-term site, sorry. There's multiple stakeholders and operators and there's a long history of soil groundwater monitoring and management. So with that in mind, this one, excuse me, still image of this particular uh, model, you can see that we have uh, a number of different data types in here. Within this model, we have lithology or geology. From that, we can develop the hydrostratigraphy. We have obviously the topographic, um, uh, the topographic uh, data implemented that all these boreholes are hung from. We have the water table, the digital elevation model of the water table. Um, we have surface water features, which you can see through the air photo, but as well as where the water table is actually expressed at land surface. Uh, and then all these yellow dots represent both permanent, like uh, monitoring infrastructure, like monitoring wells, et cetera, as well as one time soil analytical data from soil monitoring and management boreholes, as well as um, the boreholes associated with the installation of monitoring wells, where you get one snapshot of soil quality. So within this one picture, we have hundreds of locations, each with hundreds of pot potential analytes um, over as much as 10 years of soil monitoring and management data. So all of this is in one visual environment that you're able to change symbology to quickly get at the core of your questions that you have for the data. You're able to cut live cross sections uh, into the model so that you can investigate um, more two dimensional uh, should, should that sort of clarity be required, as well as you can hang planes or, or change the topography, et cetera, such that you can understand um, potential project interactions before you get to them. Okay, so with that, we're gonna move to another mid life cycle. Uh, example that's centered around stakeholder engagement. So in this case, Jerry's just going to switch to uh, the video plane, but I'm actually just gonna do a short preamble before I start the video. So in this case, um, we, Stantec, myself particularly, was engaged by a major uh, client to actually take uh, third-party consultant data that we had not done as Stantec, but to take that data and shoehorn it into a uh, 3D conceptual site model. We had made models for this client previously and they were very impressed with the results. And in this case in particular, the stakeholder engagement element was the main thing. So despite the previous consulting having done really good work, three phases of drilling, exceptional delineation, et cetera, et cetera, they were having a really hard time conveying the, the results of the environmental investigation to a First Nations community on the left side of the highway. And so when they encountered these historical impacts during integrity work, um, of course they notified the community across the highway 
and then the community wanted some certainty that the issue was dealt with before moving forward. So with that in mind, um, I was actually engaged to present this to the community with a live demo of the uh, of the model. But in this case, um, we're just gonna, I've kind of distilled that into a, a video. So I'm gonna hit play on the video and do a little voiceover. And it's my hope within a minute 23, the length of this video, you're gonna have a detailed understanding of the site conditions and the problems at hand. So with that in mind, I'm gonna start the video. So in every uh, conceptual model, I usually start with topography, which is contoured, and you can see it slopes off to the northeast, and so does groundwater flow. You can see the pipelines in and amongst all the boreholes that were carefully drilled all around them. You can see that there's geology associated with those boreholes. The beige block at the bottom is the, is the bedrock top surface. So with that in mind, we also have the um, borehole data, the soil analytical data. In this case, it's hydrocarbon impacts, all the red dots, are in exceedance of uh, re uh, relevant guidelines, green dots pass. With that in mind, we're able to make 3D contours or 3D soil volumes of the most impacted material shown in red and the marginally impacted material shown in yellow, the in-between stuff obviously in orange. So I've just made the cross section thicker in this movie and spinning it around. So you can see that we've enveloped all of the dirty soil within our soil volumes and it's jailed, so to speak, all around by delineation wells and analytical samples shown in green. And you can see that the impacted soil uh, is all around the pipelines. Uh, with this in mind, um, we had it delineated and you can see that it's delineated on the east side of the highway. And once I presented this to the community, their uh, sense of stress associated with the environmental impacts immediately it went down. They could clearly sh see, not through AutoCAD drawings or difficult to interpret GIS maps and tables, but they could see through a schematic, highly visual uh, means that due diligence had been taken and that the situation was under control. So with this in mind, they remediated it and there the stop work order issued by the community was, was able to, uh, to be removed and they proceeded with their work. Okay, so we can advance back to the PowerPoint. Okay, next slide. Again, I have another video, but I actually have a, um, oops, sorry, that's playing again. Let's try that. Okay, here. Uh, I have another video, but I have a bit of a preamble slide to that video. So in this case, this is an end of life cycle example in which a client purchased a group of properties and they inherited uh, a bit of a mess, to be honest. Um, so with this in mind, they got all the environmental data work reports, et cetera, that had been completed on the site. So what this 3D CSMs often do is provide a path to clarity. So I've kind of done a, a very schematic workflow here on how to take basically what the client has and end up with one of these cool movies or very visual, easy to understand pictures generated by the 3D CSM. So this is a typical path. You start with all the reports, and this is actually a screen grab of one of the, one of the um, directories I used. From that, you extract the relevant 1D information, so borehole logs, etc. From that, you can also extract some useful information in 2D. In this case, the client had actually gone so far as to have the geophysical survey done, which was hung in depth space and not relative to any other site features. So you're starting to get a better understanding, but still not quite there yet. And then with my workflow incorporating all this stuff, we end up with the cool 3D model that we're going to show you next. Okay, so we can advance to the movie. Okay, um, I'll hit play in a second here. So what we have is a uh, slope site. This is a former gas plant and they had a basically a pond uh, on site that would receive both drilling waste as well as formation water. So we have a salt impact issue. It's a very remote site. So remediation is incredibly expensive. So with this in mind, I developed this conceptual site model to try to add some clarity um, to how what, what the path forward towards environmental closure for this site is. It's not operational, of course. So with that in mind, I'm gonna hit play in the movie and do another quick one minute voiceover. Okay, so we always start with topography. As I say, it slopes to the foreground. I've outlined the pond in question with the, with the brine impacts. I was able to incorporate historical information from previous consultants through geo-referenced air photos. From that, I was able to uh, locate and hang all of the lithological information, geological information, 
And with that in mind, I was able to uh, interpret that into a hydrostratigraphic framework, the yellow aquifer uh, and a sort of gray aquitard. You can see the, the water table actually flows through the surge pond. So it's a flow through type pond unlined. You can imagine if there's brine in that pond, it starts to leak out. So this is the geophysical survey data that is now no longer in two and a half dimensions, but fully uh, geospatially rendered. And these are again, 3D contours of the worst groundwater impacts based on that geophysical survey, uh, resistive deconductivity survey. So with this in mind, you can almost instantaneously within a minute, um, it's my hope that you, you, you can ascertain what's going on at this site, what may need to be done given your environmental knowledge, et cetera. So that's really uh, what we ended up with, if we go back to the presentation, was improved site knowledge. So they started with that mess of reports, okay, like I said, and oftentimes you'll run around on this step for a long time to extract the relevant information or realize you're missing key pieces. And this path becomes very convoluted. And this is uh, a stroke of genius by the organizers to actually have the follow-up presentation to this in that, as I said, digital, or sorry, data acquisition and site characterization is evolving to have more data uh, acquired more quickly uh, able to be formatted on the fly, et cetera. So the, this path may become significantly simpler should a CSM and the data acquisition to build a CSM be uh, contemplated and kept in mind at the outset of a project. So the improved site knowledge led to uh, a detailed understanding of the hydrostratigraph framework, the hydraulic characteristics of that framework, and that allowed me to do analytical mass transport models. So this diagram on the side shows a landfill, but it's really just a schematic to show um, conservative uh, contaminants of concern like salts or chloride moving in an unconfined groundwater table environment. So with the detailed understanding of the site conditions, I was able actually to use analytical mass transport models, which is just a fancy way to say spreadsheet models to look at mass transport in a groundwater flow system. I was able to back calculate um, uh, a lot of site characteristics and then use those to forward model potential outcomes. So this supported, uh, it may support numerical modeling if they decide to go down that road. We haven't gone to that stage yet, but it definitely supported the remediation planning given the cost of uh, remediating in a remote environment. Um, they wanted to be absolutely sure it was going to make an impact. So some of the modeling that was a derivative from the 3D conceptual site model I made, really helped them with this. It helped them with risk analysis. It's helping them with the regulatory engagement, as well as, again, there's a First Nations uh, community nearby to this site, and it's also helping them explain uh, through public engagement the site conditions and what they're doing about things to remedy it. Okay, and then just to wrap up, uh, benefits from project examples. So these are observations and client feedback that I've had personally and the project teams I've been on have had personally is that most all clients see value in the unification of the data in one 3D environment. So data that they've had, but never really been able to make much sense of, all of a sudden uh, makes sense. Um, historical data that may have been forgotten about or uh, not thought of as, as relevant anymore can actually add a lot of clarity, um, fill data gaps, et cetera. So there's a ton of, ton of value to um, the compilation, normalization, an integration of all your data into a 3D conceptual site model. Uh, when there's multi multidisciplinary project teams, there's massive benefits. So many situations where I've had the environmental group is the our primary contact, but then they have to interact with either uh, uh, operations and major projects, etc. So if everybody's coming to the table with a different conceptual model of the sandbox that they're playing in in mind, it becomes very difficult for multidisciplinary project teams to come to some consensus. So it's it's really a decision support tool at that point. And then, as I hope to have demonstrated, there's vastly improved stakeholder engagement. So stuff that's usually too complicated to explain to a layperson becomes easy to understand and to explain for that matter. And lastly, uh, as I said earlier, these are not required for all jobs. 3D conceptual site models can be expensive and they can be, um, uh, time consuming, but with the thresholds I tried to present at the start of the talk in mind, you know, the scale, complexity, the given audience you're going to present this to, you can make informed decisions. It's my hope now with this in mind. Um, 
They're ideal for data compilation, not to mention data management in some capacity, and, visualiza and visualization of complex geospatial programs, problems. Sorry. So uh, they're particularly useful for long-term environmental programs, compliance, monitoring, et cetera. And uh, my sense is that on, on, on legacy sites, the ability to leverage historical data is of great value. Um, I think we've demonstrated, albeit through only four examples, that they support all stages of a project life cycle, and that I hope through the first example I showed you that uh, it would be clear why and how uh, early adoption would add value to a project, especially one that's going to be long-term in nature. And I believe that's it. Open for questions. Thank you very much. Joe, fantastic presentation. Really learned a lot. And I think that along with your presentation and Chris's, it really speaks to the fact that, you know, in today's digital economy, it can really be argued that data has an immense untapped value to it. And it's in how we use it, those specific use cases. Thank you for bringing those to life. Um, so I, I see a question here, Joe, that I'm going to posed to you from one of our audience members. Um, the question is, is this technology being used to assist in designing trenchless pipeline crossings? It most certainly could be used for those applications. Um, generally, to my knowledge, uh, uh, trenchless pipeline crossings will have some notion of the uh, geology and geotechnical conditions in mind. And much of this can be implemented quite readily, in fact, with um, in a, in a three-dimensional conceptual site model or geo geological model would be another way to put it, whereby you would enter all your data, uh, ascertain whether or not there is uh, risks associated both from um, the uh, pressures in the various aquifers you may encounter, as well as the uh, thicknesses of, of various cap rock uh, or cap unit, so to speak, um, that you'll be drilling through. So uh, HDD often has issues where they've the long uh, horizontal borehole will intersect over pressured units and whatnot. So um, basically, by able being able to uh, visualize, pre-visualize your your HDD route and what pressures and geological entities it will intersect, it can most certainly be used to help out uh, with horizontal directional drilling applications for sure. Uh, excellent, thank you. I think we have one more here, um, Joe. For an average project, how long can the data entry into the model take you to perform? That's a great question. Um, it's kind of a sliding scale answer, unfortunately. Uh, in a lot of cases, we're digitizing, that is transcribing borehole data that might be um, in hard copy only from a dot matrix printout of a borehole log made on like a VIC-20 or something. So uh, in those cases, it, you have to be really sure that there's going to be value in, in, in transcribing and digitizing a historical data. Uh, but in other cases, such as projects with a pre-existing database and rigorous data management, um, or even just simply uh, projects with uh, vast quantities of digital lab data, all that is easily um, and efficiently sucked into the model. Um, the one caveat to that is, is that these models are only as good as the geospatial information that they're provided with. So if borehole locations are approximate and or um, you're working from old site diagrams that weren't necessarily to scale, those are some of the limitations in terms of the accuracy, but notwithstanding that you can still uh, definitely efficiently get data into a model and uh, assess whether or not it it will um, shed light on the on the specific problem you might be asking about that site or about that contaminant situation or whatever. Well, Joe, thank you so much uh, for sharing how 3D conceptual site models help in several phases of the life cycle, um, and also for sharing a bit about yourself. So, if there's any other questions, we'll collect them and answer them following um, our the end of the presentation today. And with that, I'd like to have Chris Jorstad introduce himself and kick off our second presentation. So over to you, Chris. Thanks, Chelsea, and thanks, Joe. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Jorstad, and I have the, the privilege of presenting uh, Stantec's M-Tools solution. And uh, 
hopefully in the, the course of my presentation, you'll see the value that uh, we believe we've developed uh, and the benefits for all of the project teams. Uh, a little about myself, um, I lead a team called the System Support Team. And what we do is we actually are embedded with project teams to provide support for various software tools and applications. And we actually work directly with the project teams to ensure that the project deliverables and, and the client needs are met and that we find efficient and effective ways to uh, accomplish the work and actually create the deliverables. Uh, personally, um, I've got 32 years of experience in, uh, in aerospace, uh, defense, industrial. I'm a project manager, uh, Six Sigma Black Belt, and I'm also a professional musician. So uh, for any of you that are musicians, you can appreciate uh, that's why I have to have a full-time job. So uh, it's, it's been an interesting climate uh, recently with all of that. Uh, so many musicians like myself are starving for opportunities to play for people. So, all right, oops, oh, there we go. So uh, what is mTools? Uh, mTools is a proprietary solution that Stantec developed over 10 years ago. And we all have uh, the same problem. And, and the problem is, is how do we effectively collect information to support uh, the projects. How do we take all of that information and get it in the right hands of the right people at the right time in the right format so that they can make effective decisions and also stay on top of the critical aspects of their projects. So mTools itself actually, it just stands for management tools and the application uh, is really built to support any kind of a project, whether it's a construction management project, whether it's project management, whether it's simple field inspections, environmental, you name it. Um, we actually have developed um, the capability to quickly and easily adapt the tool for any kind of project. So the slide here, uh, the 65 years in the making, uh, Stantec's really a company of other companies. And one of the biggest challenges we've found is there is no shortage of tools out there. There's literally hundreds if not thousands of different software tools and applications and it's virtually impossible for any company to be able to evaluate and assess what's the right tool how's it going to benefit them how's it going to benefit uh, your clients so because we're a company of many companies we were afforded the benefit of being able to reach into our organization and and draw from the experiences that all of our team members have had using different solutions, engaging with different clients and communities. And that really helped us to define um, what we needed to do, what we needed to enhance and build, and, and also what, what we believe was truly aligned with our, uh, you, our clients' needs and wants. So um, that ability to have that reach back and be able to get insight and, and analysis from others really helps us to uh, to move forward and stay on track. I mentioned that we, we've built a solution that really can operate across any business type. Um, again, we're, we're a large company. We have an excellent community of clients. Uh, we have excellent community of vendors and, and regulatory authorities and all those groups. And the real challenge is, is how do we collect all of this information uh, across all of that diverse uh, network of people, groups, and interests, and, and still do it in an effective and efficient way. Um, we have to have a solution that's truly adaptive to your needs uh, and the project needs so that we can tailor it. But at the same time, we have to balance that with being able to quickly deploy it and stand it up. And uh, so we can't treat every deployment as a custom adventure or, or a one-off. So what we found is, despite the diversity of the, the businesses and, and the projects and programs we, we operate in, there's actually a lot of commonality. Uh, often what we find is it's more terminology that's different than the actual approach or the needs. So um, again, because we're embedded with the business, um, 
it helps us to ferret out where are we truly different and where are we similar and how can we leverage that similarity to uh, reduce the time it takes for us to deploy onto a project. So mTools itself is, is a number of tools. It's uh, what we needed was the ability to collect information in the field. Uh, we needed the ability to bring information from all kinds of legacy systems, uh, from, from your systems, uh, regulatory authority systems, uh, and be able to then collaborate on that information and take all of that information and data and compile it to then produce the required reports, dashboards, uh, deliverables, uh, so that the project needs are satisfied and then ultimately build the project, uh, the turnover packages or whatever the project deliverables are in a quick and efficient manner. So what we did is we looked at what technology was out there and it's, 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 not as, uh, it's not as detailed as what Joe got the opportunity to show in terms of how, how um, interesting it is from an engineering perspective, Simply put, what we do is we gather information uh, using devices such as smartphones, iPads, laptops, legacy systems. We have all of these inputs. And one of the challenges is when we're in the field, we need the ability to work offline. We have to have a way to bring that data and sync it and, and bring it into the collaboration site where a number of people then can review it and determine the accuracy of it. And, and then process that information to move it forward in terms of um, daily reports, dashboards, KPIs, uh, analysis, risk assessments, any, any of those things. Um, but one of the benefits we found is how do we more quickly uh, get feedback back to the people inputting the data? Uh, because as Joe alluded, if, if your data is, is weak, then your conclusions can be weak, your outputs are weak. So one of the things that we've done is develop the ability where as soon as I make an entry in the system and I sync it, the supervisor or whoever's processing that information can immediately inform me uh, by reviewing that, that input and tell me whether or not you know, it's too weak, I'm missing data sets. Um, what we found is that the overall quality of the inputs and that real-time correction of people's behaviors and approaches has driven the quality through the roof. It, it's really enhanced it. It's reduced the amount of rework and it's allowed us in very short order to collect that information and then be able to act on it. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we're having a problem. So um, one of the, the unique things about collecting field information is that the, the format and the structure by which I collect it does not necessarily reflect the output. So we have to have a way of easily being able to convert that information. And more importantly, um, for the people that are collecting the information, how do we structure it in a way for, for them to make it easy to do their job and follow the flow of how they do their job, yet be able to automatically reconfigure that information to meet the output requirements? So on, on this slide, what you're seeing is actually the output. The, the input to that report looked very different when we did it in the field on the smartphone and the iPad, yet it automatically configures it to this output format, which is perfectly aligned to the requirements of the project so that uh, now it's very simple. There's no army of people converting stuff. There's no army of people having to review. It, it becomes a, a very clean and easy exercise. In terms of, uh, of the data that we, we process, what we have found is that um, often, Projects will uh, have a large number of items that they truly want to collect or believe that they truly want to collect. And one of the lessons learned that we found is it's very easy for uh, projects and teams to gold plate. 
And um, one of the things that we try to do when we deploy technology is, is actually understand the process, understand the team's needs, and actually uh, help manage change so that you're not uh, producing more data than you need and that everything's truly aligned with what, what the project needs to be successful. Um, that's probably the biggest issue we encounter is once people get a taste of uh, the simplicity and how easy it is, uh, they keep asking for more and more and more. And, and it's, it's very, um, it's a nice feeling when you've produced a product that gets that kind of response. The flip side is you have to be able to manage that so that you don't overwhelm the project with information that's ultimately not going to be used. One of the other things, oh, sorry, I'm having some technical issues here. Um, not only is it is it to capture narrative information or numerical data, Bill showed you uh, all of the all of the 3D model and then all of that information and, and all of that stuff can be brought in. That's really one of the true strengths of what we've tried to accomplish, which is we needed a platform to bring data from all of these various sources and be able then to communicate it out to the various groups. In addition to that, um, as you saw in the CAD model and, and, and the, the models that we presented, there's a there's an inspection or a verification side where you've got individuals they need to now validate what they see and and so as part of the solution we've got we've built in 3d mapper uh, gps mapping sketching barcode scanning uh and imaging and there's a cliche and it, it, it really is true which is a picture is worth a thousand words and on the on the right hand side what you see um this is actually part of a punch list. And when we approached the, the, the vendor, there's no argument. Um, you have that picture there, it shows the unpainted steel on that assembly. It, it's very quick and easy that it solves the problem. Here's the issue, remedy it. It also reduces the amount of back and forth. Where was it, how was it? It just simplifies the process immensely, which ultimately means quicker time to completion, less cost, less effort, less stress. In addition to that, um, all of this information, as, as Joe mentioned, it's about visualization. So um, all projects run on dashboards, at least the ones I've been exposed to. Uh, so how do, we, how do we simplify that process of bringing all that information in? So, one of the, the things and the biggest challenges that we had was how do we progress? How do we measure the performance and how do we automate that data and, and push it into a format that's highly visual so that all of the stakeholders can see it? So one of the big things that we've accomplished is to be able right from your field report to provide your progress and then instantaneously update your dashboards. And that covers any number of topics from progress in terms of construction, issues, risks. Um, it can be also associated with schedule, uh, health and safety, environmental concerns. It, it doesn't matter the topic, it's whatever the project needs and what are the key performance indicators uh, you need to accomplish. The bottom line is, is how do we do that without employing, again, armies of people to take information and reconstitute it to, to get the end result. That, uh, there was a comment Chelsea made about the power of, of data, and it really is uh, something a lot of industries and groups now are, are, are coming to terms with, which is we've collected information, and outside of the immediate needs of the project, there is a true value to that information. Uh, one of the areas that we're seeing uh, garner a lot of attention is uh, asset and risk management. And these are very interesting times as we can all appreciate. Uh, one of the things that we see continuously now is uh, clients, owners, uh, everybody's under huge budget pressures. And when we talk about capital investment, how, how can we make smart decisions? And 
the old way was we would collect data, there'd be numerous surveys, reports, studies, whatever. But there's a, a heck of a lot of information through the process of executing a project that can ultimately be used down the road. And um, as we saw with the modeling, the ability to take that data and, and put it into a format where you can make a compelling case and story is, is critical. And in this case, it's hard to see in this picture, but uh, on this project, it's a, it's a major water line. And we took the data and the client was trying to determine where they should make their investment. And we actually did a risk analysis and a study of the asset. And it's hard to see, but in that picture, downslope of that is actually a small community. And it turns out that if there was a, a breach in that line at that point, uh, there was a high probability that the community was going to be dramatically impacted. So again, using data that was collected for a completely different purpose, we're able to reuse that data to a greater effect and ultimately help the client make strong and effective decisions. And it all ends up with how, how do we get the packages done? Uh, whatever the deliverable is, um, again, I, I use it, probably overuse this term, but armies of people. Uh, having been one of those people, I can appreciate all the effort it takes to take all of this information, all these sheets, scraps of paper, everything that existed. Our approach and, and looking at it is, is we ultimately, we really don't care where the information comes from. What we need to do is take it from all of these sources, whether it's uh, whether it's standards, specifications, drawings, regulatory reports, anything, marry it all up and then be able to structure it in a way where you can easily compile it and quickly and simply deliver it uh, to all stakeholders so that the, the manual effort of putting this stuff together is dramatically re reduced. It, you saw in a previous slide, we're experiencing about a 35% reduction in the, the amount of time it's taking us to put our turnover packages together. So uh, the benefit for, for all of us is, is pretty profound because it simplifies the process for us. Uh, the other stakeholders, whether it's uh, the client, the owner, um, interested parties, uh, regulatory, they all have access to uh, be able to use the information. They can work on the collaboration site and ultimately contribute uh, to the completion of, of ultimately the turnover package. So um, our experiences and our lessons learned is um, truly uh, we're, we're actually victims of our own success. Uh, we're continually seeing a huge demand for this, a lot of uh, appreciation and excitement because uh, we are really just trying to make life easier for people and uh, and help make the process and the effort of putting it all together way less uh, stressful. So with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'd gladly entertain them. Yeah, thanks, Chris, very much. I think there's uh, several people that can appreciate just how difficult it's been to manage, you know, hordes of paper and armies of people. Um, and would rather be spending that valuable resource actually truly managing the project rather than compiling and doing the reporting piece. So from a collaboration perspective, I think this is an extremely powerful tool that I wish, you know, I had had back when I was one of those hordes of people in the field. So we have a few questions, Chris. Um, first, I'll start with this one. It's uh, the question is for a pipeline build, say 30K of a normal Alberta operating condition pipeline, how long would it take to set up mTools for an average level of data collection and reporting and auditing? Um, there's going to be a lot of factors um, that would set that. And again, not knowing the true scope, uh, I don't want to say it's going to be easy, but uh, I'll stop sounding like a politician. We've developed hundreds of the reports, standardized reports that you need for facilities construction and pipeline construction. So in terms of deploying it on a 30K project, uh, not a lot of effort. I, I would say if, if it's a truly um, a clean scope, uh, there's no um, obscure regulatory requirements or reporting requirements, uh, we can stand the solution up. 
within weeks and use, again, leveraging the existing reporting we have and our knowledge uh, on the types of key uh, process, uh, KPIs that the project's going to need. So it's very short cycle time to deploy. Right. Like you and I have spoken about this a lot just to develop my understanding. And, and most of what we've talked about was that when we say it's customizable, it doesn't mean that we're starting from ground zero all the time. We have an immense library of pre-existing reports, especially because this has been used on a variety of pipelines already. So there's a library um, basis, I guess, and then the customization comes with the discovery uh, meetings with the client and the project setup. Yeah, if I could add to that, I think the other strength is, is again, we're embedded with the project. so we've we've relied on the people actually doing the job to construct the reports so we've found the reports are right and they work because the people that are doing the job are the ones that actually help construct them perfect um okay i have a another question here chris um has it been a challenge to convince clients that the input forms can be quite different than the output? I mean, this is obviously very different than a paper form where you have, you know, data in is data out. It's a fixed and static report form. Has it been challenging to talk to clients about the inputs and how they can be used as an output? Uh, it depends on the client. Uh, generally not, and and the reason I say that is um, our ability to align to either pre-existing requirements uh, and the way we've we've approached building the solution has meant that it's pretty easy for us to show and and show quickly the output's going to match exactly what you need and the input matches how people do the job. And I, I think when people uh, see that, they go, that makes absolute sense, right? So it, it hasn't been a huge um, uh, challenge for us. Again, I think the biggest challenge for us has been once people get used to it, they, they overwhelm us with additional wants. Yeah, I think that's probably um, a discovery portion of it as they get to know the power of the tool. There's obviously more and more ideas that are generated on its use. Um, and on that, I have one more question here just to wrap up. How intuitive is it for a person who has not been on the project to go through the turnover package? Is there any type of training required? Um. I'm not sure I, I fully appreciate the question. Uh, I guess what is the question around how to use the tool to review it? Um, I guess I would I would probably try and you know reword it just to say if there's a turnover package that's required to be handed over to a client, how intuitive is it to access the final data set? Very easy. Okay. So the the way we construct it is whatever the deliverables plan is, it's aligned to that. So it follows the project requirements. But in terms of navigating the tool to find what you need, it's incredibly intuitive. Uh, we use highly visual um, buttons to steer people directly to the information that they want. So in the case of a, a turnover package, you'd literally have a button that says turnover package, click on it, and you would see all your packages and you would be able to open them and review them. Okay, so basically if they can click through a menu on a website, it's probably that they would be able to access what they're looking for. Absolutely. Perfect. Well, um, just with two minutes to go here, I wanted to thank both Chris and Joe for their time. Um, here's some of their contact information because we would love for you guys to get in touch with our presenters directly. Um, again, if there's any follow-up items that we haven't addressed during the question period, we will do so um, privately after this session ends. And you'll expect from us uh, a quick brief survey. Many of you are returning attendees, so this will look very familiar, but it does help us select our future topics 
Um, for now, we'll be delivering these digitally until the foreseeable future and some changes that allow us to go back to having the breakfast in person, perhaps. But we'd also love to know if you prefer this. Maybe maybe this is the preferred method uh, going forward. So thank you so much for your valuable time and spending an hour of your morning with us. Hope you guys had a chance to enjoy a coffee and some uh, new ideas on how to use your digital tools and data sets for more effective projects. Thank you guys.